No, no, they're busy checking. Okay, everyone. Well, thank you very much uh, for coming to this um, uh, social party day school. Um, uh, some, uh, some good number of you, which is quite nice to see. Um, uh, before I do anything else, I I'll uh, just go over the. the the, the, the housekeeping. Uh, if there is anything approaching something that looks like fire, then the fire exits are through the main door here, or up the stairs and straight ahead through the um, passageway and to the, the door at the back. So just straight that way or straight that way up the stairs. If you do have uh, mobile phones, if you can just check them just to make sure that they're off, unless you have a, a real need to, to actually have them on. Um, okay. Uh, the day school today is dedicated to um, well, it's dedicated to Marx. Um, as socialists, we have a, a debt to Marx, and in particular to um, two of Marx's uh, principal theories: the labour theory of value and the materialist conception of history. So we've got two uh, speakers today, uh, one of whom will be speaking on uh, economics, which is this lecture now you're about to hear now, and one on historical materialism. And then this afternoon, uh, we'll also have a lecture on Marx and the anarchists. It will be a discussion of, of the, uh, uh, the anarchists that Marx actually, actually knew. So the times for that, we're starting now with, um, uh, with uh, talk on Marx and economics. Uh, we'll break, we'll have a talk, and then we'll have some discussion afterwards. We'll break at one o'clock uh, for lunch. Then in the afternoon at two o'clock, we'll have a talk on um, Marx and uh, materialism, why history matters, and that will be given by Gwyn Thomas. And then at 3.30, uh, we'll have Marx on the anarchists I knew, and the speaker then will be uh, Adam Buick. Uh, but for this, uh, for this talk, um, and we have to announce a slight change in, in the programme. Uh, the subject matter is broadly uh, similar, but unfortunately Stuart Watkins won't be with us today. So um, uh, Daryl Poynton has, uh, has uh, agreed to step in at the last minute. So uh, without further comment, I will pass you over to him. Right, thanks for having me. Um, economics, or political, political economy as it used to be called, is the study of how men and society choose, with or without the use of money, to employ scarce productive resources which could have alternative uses to produce various commodities over time and distribute them for consumption now and in the future among various people and groups in society. Uh, this is a quote from Paul Samuelson, who is a uh, author of many best-selling economics textbooks. So, according to this definition, economics used to be called political economy. So, the only difference between these two things should be the name only, not the uh, subjects that they cover. Now, economic theoretician and historian I.I. I. Rubin had uh, this definition of political economy. Political economy deals with human working activity <coughs> not from the standpoint of its technical methods and instruments of labour, but from the standpoint of its social form. It deals with productive relations which are established amongst people in the process of production. So, by this definition, political economy is not the ahistorical study of the allocation of scarce resources, but it's the study of social relations, of culture. Uh, as Freddie Perlman said, political economy asks why the productive forces of society develop within a particular social form, why the machine process unfolds within the context of business enterprise, why industrialization takes the form of capitalist development, <coughs> Political economy asks how the working activity of people is regulated in a specific historical form of economy. 
that's what Freddie Perlman said. Um, so economics, as it is known today, has its roots in what became known as the marginalist revolution of the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, its theorists sought to build a theory based more closely on the mathematical models of the physical sciences. And they would sort of sought to downplay the uh, importance of the historical and social factors. Uh, in the late 19th century, coinciding with the publication of a textbook called Economics by Alfred Marshall, the term economics came to replace political economy. So what is taught as economics today has its roots in these theories rather than the more broadly social and historically based works of people like Adam Smith, Ricardo and John Stuart Mill. Now the um, stated aim of Marx and his study of society is stated in the preface of Capital. He says his aim was to lay bare the economic law of motion of modern society. Uh, he goes on further to say, to describe his method, in the, analysis, in the analysis of economic forms, neither microscopes nor chemical agents are of use. The force of abstraction must replace both. Here individuals are dealt with only insofar as they are personifications of economic categories, embodiments of particular class relations and class interests. My standpoint, from which the evolution of the economic formation of society is viewed as a process of natural history, can less than any other make the individual responsible for relations whose creature he socially remains, however much he may subjectively raise himself above them. The physicist either observes physical phenomena where they occur in their most typical form and most free form dis dis disturbing influence, or wherever possible, he makes experiments under conditions that assume the occurrence of the phenomena and its normality. In this work, I have to examine the capitalist mode of production and the conditions of production and exchange corresponding to that mode. So Marx's project is not really a work of economics where through a series of increasingly more complex equations you're trying to arrive at an accurate theory of price. Instead, it's a work of political economy, or more precisely, it's a critique of political economy, where he seeks to investigate the material, social and historical reasons that explain why modern society is organised in the way it is today. Uh, the method used by Marx is commonly referred to as either historical materialism or dialectical materialism. Now these terms don't originate from Marx himself, but from Engels and Plekhanov respectively. Uh, these terms can be slightly misleading in the fact that it wasn't the intention of Marx to create some kind of a super historical theory of history, which can be applied to all, all eras of historical existence. Uh, it's not to say Marx did not have a method, but um, I won't dwell on Marx's method too much because that could take up another talk, really. Uh, Rosalind Wallach Below, I guess is how you pronounce her name, gives us an interesting formulation of Marx's method in her book, Dialectical Phenomenology. I, I would have reworded this a bit in a bit sort of less academic language if I had time, but bear with me. So, Rule one, treat concepts as grounded in a historically specific form of life or mode of production. So concepts are the way in which we appropriate the world as a totality. However, concepts are not the products of a mind that is outside of or independent of the world. Although the world as a totality is produced by analysis, the real world and its relations do, do exist concretely before analysis. Marx states that concepts can never exist other than as an abstract, one-sided relation within an already given concrete living whole. 
Rule two, treat individuals as grounded in a historically specific form of life or mode of production. According to this rule, one resists treating individuals' decisions, intentions or characteristics as the grounds of action. Rather, one treats individuals' decisions, intentions and characteristics as grounded in <coughs> and having sense in terms of a form of life. It treats individual acts as made possible or intelligible by a form of life which they presuppose. Rule three, according to Roslyn Buller, is a treat a form of life as a totality of internal relations. A form of life as a totality of internal relations then refers to the relations that are ne necessary for the production of the object that one studies. The relations are internal to its process of production. This differs from treating a social formation as everything that can be collected as existing within a particular historical period or within particular boundaries. Thus the form of life that Marx anal analyses is conceived as a totality of the subjective objective conditions for the production of capital. And rule four, treat a concrete form of life as contradictory. Now this is kind of referring to dialectics. This rule constitutes the principle of growth. A concrete form of life is a result of a self-contradictory movement, a subjectivity that is divided into opposing moments. A contradictory form of life is a totality of opposing moments, moments that negate each other. Uh, so that's something I pulled out of a book by Rosalind Blow. Uh, perhaps this can be summed up a, a little bit more pithily by Engels in the preface to Capital Volume 3, where he says it would be wrong to look into Marx for fixed, cut and dry definitions that are valid for all time. It should go without saying that where things and their mutual relations are conceived not as fixed, but rather as changing in their mental images, Two, i.e. concepts, are also subject to change and reformulation. That they are not to be encapsulated in rigid definitions, but rather in their process of historical or logical formulation. Okay, so bear all that in mind, and now I'll try to give you a very brief and sort of fleeting thumbnail sketch of Marx's value theory. So Marx begins his inquiry with an, with an analysis of the commodity. He does this because the commodity is the economic cell form of the capitalist mode of production. The internal relations of the commodity contain in a germ-like state the relations of commodity producing society as a whole. Now, he gives some definitions in the first few chapters of capital. So it defines a commodity as any useful product of human labour <laughs> that is produced to be exchanged. And he says it has both a use value in that it can be put to fulfil a certain use and that it has a value in that it embodies a certain amount of society's labour time. Now the term use value doesn't refer to the amount of usefulness that an object can prov provide and it's not a term of moral judgment. So for instance an atom bomb is as much a use value as a potato or something like that. Uh, now value it's only visible through exchange value, through the ratios at which different commodities exchange in the marketplace. So. As I've said, all commodities are the product of a certain amount of human labour time, and it is this which gives commodities their intrinsic value. So this is a thing we compare uh, when we're comparing commodities against each other to exchange them. So commodities that take more labour to create have a higher value than ones that take less. And as labour becomes more productive, as it becomes easier to produce things, their value falls. 
uh, but value is not determined by the actual amount of private labour that it takes to produce a commodity, but by the uh, amount of socially necessary labour time needed to reproduce it by the, uh, by the average social time. I love, there's a little example I've copied here, I'll just read out. Let's say the average widget takes one hour, yeah, sorry, the average widget maker takes one hour to make a widget. The social average is the social val value of the commodity, the amount of time society requires to make a widget. But I'm old and slow, slow. I take three hours. This is my individual value. My individual value is higher than the social value. But that doesn't mean that I can sell my widget for more. I must sell it at the social average. Marx calls this the socially necessary labour time. In this case, the determination of social value is made not by my individual labour time, but by the average social productivity of society. If the socially necessary labour time changes due to changes in production and productivity, then the individual value and social value will change too. Supply is determined by the total amount of labour that goes into making widgets and the productivity of that labour. But when we go to the widget factory to work, we do not know how much labour as a whole society is devoting to making widgets. There could be a million other people making widgets or only a few. We only learn how much labour society has put into widget making when we enter the market to compare the products of our labour with the rest of society. If too much labour goes into widget making, then there is an oversupply of widgets. The social value falls below their individual value. If not enough work has gone into widgets, there is an undersupply and their social value rises above their individual value. This fluctuation of social value around individual value is what allows labour to be apportioned. Uh, so, I don't know how clear that example was, but it was asked questions at the end. So intrinsic value is it's not something hidden deep inside the commodity, some sort of physical substance we could uh, measure or observe if we had the right tools but it's a social relation and it's one we can only observe through exchange value at the ratios where commodities exchange. It appears, and so instead of being a so, as appearing as a social relation, it appears as a, as a relation between objects. This is what Marx is referring to when he speaks of the fetishism of commodities. Since all goods have been turned into commodities and access to non-commodified materials restricted, those without the means of producing anything to exchange must sell the only thing they have, that is their capacity to work and bring themselves back to work the next day. Uh, we call this their labour power. So capitalist society is a society of classes. On the one hand you have the capitalists, those who use their monopoly on the productive wealth, which is factories, raw materials, and land, etc., to create more wealth. And on the other hand, you have the workers who have to sell their labour power in order to subsist. Um, but capitalist production is not only production for exchange, it's production for profit. So, at the beginning of the process, the capitalist has a certain amount of money with which they purchase the means of production and labour power. At the end of the cycle, the original sum of money plus a profit is returned. But uh, where does this extra wealth, the profit, come from? At first sight, it might look like profits come from buying cheap and selling dear. And, uh, I mean, this might be true in individual cases, but it doesn't explain the total expansion of uh, society's wealth as a whole. When we're exchanging things, we're just moving them around. So uh, when something is sold for more than it is worth, 
this transaction hasn't added to the total wealth of society. It's just merely altered the distribution of wealth. Uh, so to understand where profit comes from, we have to turn our attention away from production, oh, sorry, away from exchange and towards production. So just with all other commodities, the value of labour power is determined by the amount of socially, ne socially necessary labour time necessary to produce it. The value of labour power is therefore equal to the value of the commodities, such as trading, food and shelter, etc., necessary to produce and reproduce the worker at their current standard of living. The actual value that labour power may produce during the production process has no bearing on the value of labour power itself. So, in order to produce, the capitalist must purchase means of production, which uh, in Marx's work these are called constant capital, and labour power, which is known as variable capital. Once the production cycle is complete, the capitalist hopes to recoup these costs, plus an extra amount on top, which we call this extra amount surplus value. The value of constant capital is returned to the capitalist at a steady rate. The value of a machine is returned over its life cycle of so many years, for example. Its input value is fixed once it has been purchased and used up in the production process. Constant capital does not add new value to the commodity, but transfers its value to the commodity bit by bit. So I've got another example here, which if a million dollar machine is used to produce 10,000 cars in the course of a year before it's worn out and needs to be replaced, then effectively every car has a hundred dollars worth of machine in it. So variable capital, if it is used wisely by the capitalist, can add new value to the product. This is done by getting the labourer to work longer than the period needed to create a value equal to the cost of their labour power. So, for example, let us suppose that the worker earns 100 euros and consumes 1,000 euros worth of materials and components to produce a product which is sold for 1,300 euros. So this value can be uh, represented as constant capital, which is the, the means of production of 1,000, variable capital, which is wages of 100, plus a surplus value of 200. That 200 of surplus value was added to the product solely by the activity of the worker. Of, of these sums of values, it is only the variable capital which expands. So, in order to increase the amount of surplus labour, the capitalist has a number of options. Firstly, they can uh, strive to increase the length of the working day, or they could seek to decrease the amount of time necessary for labour to be, to be reproduced. Now, they can either do this by raising productivity through the use of technology and other, and other methods. They can uh, increase the intensity of labour, or they can seek to uh, decrease the amount of, uh, of wages in proportion to profits. Now, against all these things, the workers are seeking to increase the value of their labour power, or to at least maintain it. So this explains the uh, fundamental antagonism of interest between capitalists and workers. The more surplus value the capitalist extracts from his workers, the better he is at being a capitalist. The better the working class can resist this exploitation, the more they can defend their own interests. Uh, it's this antagonism which lies at the heart of the way that value is created in a capitalist society. So, labour power is therefore a very special commodity and it's the only one which produces more value than it costs to purchase. 
It's through labor power only that surplus value is created. So without, without the uh, purchase of labor power, the accumulation of capital would be impossible. Now, in the capitalist system, uh, capitalists are uh, in competition with each other over profits. So I'll just briefly come to talk about this. So as we've seen, in order to increase the amount of surplus value or profits coming to them, the capitalist must strive to increase the productivity of labour power. Increased productivity has the effect of lowering the value of commodities since less labour time is required to produce them. If an enterprise adopts a new production technique, which allows them to produce commodities at a rate that is below the socially necessary average labour time, they will have a competitive advantage. They can sell the commodity cheaper than their competitors and yet still make a profit, or they can sell at the same price as their competitors and make super profits. But in order to remain competitive and profitable, their competitors have to adopt this new technique also. Once all the competitors have done this, the uh, socially necessary average is now reduced across the whole board. So instead of originally being a means of gaining a competitive edge, the new technique is now necessary for just standing still for remaining in business. It is this never-ending never ending need to improve production techniques <coughs> that creates the dynamic of capitalism. In order to simply stand still, the capitalists must reinvest the majority of their surplus value. Without keeping pace of developments in machinery and technological advances, the capitalist would go out of business and cease to be a capitalist. In this sense, then, capitalism can be seen as a system not for the enrichment of individuals, but as a system for the never-ending accumulation of capital for its own sake. Now, uh, Marx uh, had a theory of a crisis in a capitalist society. It was a, uh, the whole work of Marx was a, is, is in an incomplete form, though, so this is kind of a rough rule of thumb which I'm going to go through. But So in uh, primitive societies where production is not yet market dependent, crises take the form of disease, pestilence, famine and natural disasters. But in capitalist societies, crisis tends not to be caused by nature. For the most part, we can store enough surpluses to protect us against the ravages of the elements. But capitalist crises occur when the market mechanisms that regulate the distribution of labour break down. This is not because of some external influence which disrupts an otherwise balanced system, but because of the internal contradictions of capital which periodically present and resolve themselves through crisis. It is not so much a problem of man against nature as a problem of man against man. So capitalists throw their money into circulation in order to have it returned as a profit. When there are no profitable avenues of investment to be found, the productive cycle freezes up Commodities pile up in warehouses, debts cannot be paid, and economic activity comes to a grinding halt. As a result of the competitive struggle for profits, capitalists must invest more and more in the technological apparatus of production. The effect is to reduce capital's dependence on labour. Tasks require less labour to complete, and a gen general de-skilling takes place making it easier to lay off workers and to decrease their ability to resist. The ratio of variable to constant capital decreases, but as variable capital is also the source of surplus value, a fall in the rate of profit occurs. Capital goes looking for a profit, but can't find enough places for profit because it has annihilated its own ability to create value. Crisis can only be overcome 
by the devaluing of capital. Now this is done by selling off commodities cheaper, cheaply, by laying off workers, shutting down factories, dropping property prices, and, well, in effect having a bargain basement clear out of uh, capital that's been over accumulated. Now, some capitalists do not survive this purge, but some do, and those that do will be able to buy the assets of their former competitors and knock down prices, thus fueling the next round of accumulation. The tendency of the rate of profit to fall does not mean that profit rates are on a continual downward slope towards zero. Instead, it means that we can expect a period of falling profit rates before the onset of a crisis and then a rest restoration of them once a sufficient amount of capital has been devalued. There are also countervailing tendencies which can have the effect of lessening or even cancelling out the fall in profit. These include attempting to depress wages below the value of labour power by cheapening the elements of constant capital, that's by cheapening the factories and productive machinery, and by opening new markets and through continual technological in innovation. So, in conclusion, I mean, what all I've given you here is a very incomplete and fleeting glimpse at some aspects of Marx's theory of value. Uh, the modern editions of the Grundrisse critique of political economy and the three volumes of Capital take up about <coughs> 4,000 pages. So, I mean, all I can hope to give you here is just a very brief starting point. Uh, by studying capitalism, we can learn that human society is not the result of some eternal logic or divine laws, but that it is created through our own actions as we produce and use the things we use every day. Once we can begin to answer how and why society works in the way it does, we are already some way towards understanding what can be done to change it. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. Thanks, Donald. Um, okay, everyone. Well, I'm sure you're, you're burning to, uh, to, to um, ask some questions on that one. Uh, who's going to start the ball running? Who's going to take the first shot at this? Lovely. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was interested, uh, when you quoted Samuelson at the beginning, um, yeah. good old Samuelson, the great textbook writer. Um, your definition, you know, I found interesting. Yeah. Allocation of scarce resources with or without money. I found that an interest. I, did, I didn't realise he actually said that. I yeah, that I mean, yeah. With or without money. What was he doing? Was there a, did someone not proof his work or something? <laughs> <laughs> so well, yeah, I'm not sure. What, quite interesting. Yeah, though. I'm not sure which edition yeah. of uh, his textbook. Whether that's in the new edition yeah. or not. But seems a bit of a concession on his part. Yeah. Bear in mind, he was a. He was obviously. Yeah, or marginalist theory. Is not yeah, true. unless he's trying to track his track his theory further back into history, perhaps as well. Yeah, he's said with all that money. Yeah, that's yeah. worth looking into. Just plays yeah. Out of yeah. Anyone else? Any comments? I thought that was a really good talk, and I'd like a photocopy of the talk if possible. Yeah. Thank you. I want to be honest, uh, I mean, if, if anybody, I mean, most of the things that you quoted, uh, Mark, uh, from the beginning, really, they were something that I read in the past, but I wondered how, in a sense, being in here, you know, the idea of wanting to change society, say, look, this is a madhouse we're living under. In a sense, I would say, I might take up what William Morris said uh, about having himself read Capital, but I haven't read Capital. I might have only liked yourself all those pages to read, you know, try to shortcut it and look at things and speak to people to understand it. But to get workers, for workers who want to understand it, because if capitalism is reproducing itself, it means that the workers themselves are supporting it to various degrees. But in periods like now, this crisis, 
If you look at the insides of that morning star, which I loaned to you because there's an article on the crisis and what's happening in Europe, we need to look at what workers' responses are because you're having demonstrations in India about the rising costs. There's a way that costs are rising here, but the essentials in parts of the world has been repeated now as it was in 2007. And the, the food riots that took place then, in regards to the recent riots that we just had, I looked at a small book on riots. And once the marketization of food stops in Britain in the 17th, 18th century, it's then when you start, riots started to develop where workers actually, you know, had processions, you know, with the trumpets and drums and mm. people going down to these grain stores. Now, not to uh, replicate that, to say, look, you know, violence is not the way out. Rioting is something that's spontaneous. To understand, uh, to get a grasp of it, of, of, of the system, do you think the way that we've got to present it in a way that people uh, can read it in a sense of a popular format, you know, because um, Marx is heavy going. I won't deny it. I mean, I'm not even from very much <laughs> through it, but I mean, to popularize it, to understand crises, why they're happening. I'd like to understand the crisis from the point of view of the financial side that's developed over the last 30 years. Why is it that financial capital is top heavy, where in the past financial capital was was small, we've had a, a, a vast expansion, and this inter, inter, inter de, interdependent system is affecting everything across the world now, in various degrees, America, Europe, China, Southeast Asia. Now, this is, the, this is the, what I'm trying to say in a very long way, is um, under, how, how do we get workers from not supporting, the ones around here are not, uh, we don't know if this support or not, but we know that the demonstrations in Greece, Ireland, Spain, India, America. So workers are being stirred up by this very crisis, but thinking that money is the cause, thinking that if only the, the governments uh, continue with the debt austerity measures, it's going to rectify it. According to Galloway, we're having in place now things that happened with structural adjustment in the African states, when they said to them, right, you've got to get rid of your in infrastructure, welfare, hospitals, education, all the things that support uh, the functioning of a society. So, you know, this... Uh, I, was, I don't know what... what, what um, was I agree, they don't know how to get a question out of that, but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. It's, how do we get our ideas across in well, a popular I guess the, way that... The only way you know, can get ideas across is by discussing with people yeah. and using every yeah. means at our disposal, isn't it? Yeah. But uh, I'll ask you a que the question. Why is it that the trade unions are putting forward saying that the, the, the austerity measures the, uh, is a political action, it's an ideological response? In other words, there's an option to do something else. What is, their, what is the option in their terms? That, 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 is it a Keynesian option? If it is... Well, unions, have, they're on a reformist agenda, aren't they? So they're probably following some sort of Keynesian scheme. Yeah, I think, uh, I think implicit in the question is like, you know, that we should be beating ourselves up because we haven't got a, we, we don't seem to have a way of putting our arguments that can convince like the rest of the working class. Well, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't subscribe to that at all. Um, I think we, we, we put forward our ideas in, in, in a way that, in, in every way possible, and, and in a way that's easily understood. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to understand it, and I wouldn't be here today. So, uh, so it's not, it's not, uh, it's not necessarily, it's not completely up to our party to, to, to bring about a revolution. It's up to the working class, and, uh, and they'll do it in their own good time. I think uh, uh, today's schools like this uh, are, are very useful, and the talk that Darren's uh, given is very useful uh, to us as party members, uh, sympathisers, and people who are fairly uh, familiar with the Socialist Party. Uh, that I'm uh, pretty certain of. Uh, but what I, not just myself, but I'm sure probably most people here are well aware of, 
um, that uh, the, the, the vast majority of the population uh, walking outside there on Clapham High Street and other parts of the country uh, of the <coughs> world are not going to be uh, brought to, to socialism by a deep and detailed theory. Of course we've got to have a detailed understanding of the world. Marx has, and other people have made very, very valuable uh, contributions about that. But of course, uh, our basic task is communicating the most important elements of those uh, theories to uh, people uh, at large. And uh, the, 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 the fact uh, that there are, uh, I think, two or three important factors to be borne in mind here about how the public view uh, politics and uh, perhaps uh, economics, although they might not use that word. On, on the positive side, whereas uh, 50 or 60 years ago, political leaders were largely viewed with uh, reverence by the majority of the, the population, not just uh, in this country, but probably in, in most parts of the world. Uh, most of that uh, reverence has uh, disappeared, uh, probably particularly in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And uh, that is uh, quite good from our point of view. <laughs> because obviously we're against uh, leadership uh, in any uh, significant form and we're very much in favour of uh, a true democracy and people acting collectively for their own interests, not putting their trust in any type of uh, leadership form of uh, organisation. So that mistrust and uh, scepticism that uh, huge numbers of people have uh, now, I, I think is, is something uh, very positive and uh, good from uh, the point of view of uh, the Socialist Party. On the other side of the coin, of course, uh, politics has uh, become, uh, I think, uh, well, well, it's not just what, what I think, but I think most people would recognise that, uh, that, that politics uh, is, uh, is not of great interest to the vast majority of people, uh, probably because they've seen how politicians have uh, broken uh, promises and uh, other factors like that. Uh, the problem is that uh, most people, although they re re obviously recognise that politicians have broken promises, they don't really understand why they've broken those promises and why the uh, economic system has, uh, has uh, made, them, uh, made them do that. But I think uh, to put it in practical terms and to try to uh, put it in a nutshell, I, I think uh, all the time where we're communicating with people outside who are not uh, familiar with the Socialist Party and uh, our attitudes. We have to, obviously we've got our theories, vitally important though they are, we have to put them forward in, in simplistic uh, uh, terms. Uh, but not just that, but uh, in terms of which people can relate to their everyday experiences, why they're losing their jobs, why prices uh, are going up uh, in, the shop, uh, in the shops, why certain wars are breaking out uh, in different parts of the world. And that, oh, I, I know that there are other groups who've, uh, who've talked about this word link but it is important to, to us uh, 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 as well that we have to try and forge a link in, in people's minds between uh, the theory of opposing capitalism and looking for an uh, alternative form of socialism and how we, how we can get that link across by relating what our theory to people's uh, everyday and uh, long-term experiences. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, but, uh, okay. 
Brian? <laughs> yeah, it's simple actually. Can, can you say something about the concept of scarcity? Because this is the this is a key idea for free market, you know, for for, for classical economists, as it were. I mean, what would be Marx's uh, approach to the the whole idea of scarcity? Um, well, Marx didn't discount the idea of supply and demand being a factor in determining prices, but thing with supply and demand, okay, so uh, if demand's high and supply's low, they say that leads to a rise in price, uh, or the other way around, it leads to a fall in price, but if supply and demand are equal, you kind of, I mean, that doesn't affect the price, so kind of need some other theory apart from supply and demand to be able to explain why things have a price in the first place. Not really. it's, it's always puzzled me. I can understand, you know, years ago I joked about, you know, you know, with, with Margaret Thatcher that they were privatised water, you know, thinking that was a joke, you know, <laughs> yeah. and then they did it. And now I joke about privatising fresh air, you know. Yeah, for good ecological kind of, reasons, you know, the air is polluted, therefore we need to privatise this. And this kind of explains what is scarcity, because I mean fresh air is not scarce at all, yeah. we can all breathe it in. But if you privatise it, okay, it then becomes scarce, you know. So I, 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 that's how I kind of try and understand what is meant by scarcity. But of course it was an idea that came after Marx, I mean, you know, uh, it was only developed so by... So uh, around the same time, but... It, Malthus. Yeah. Oh, Mal oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. I'll take it. It's that tradition, isn't it? Yeah. It started with Malthus, yeah. 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 Forgot all Malthus. Anyone who hasn't spoken yet, one time? Um, Darren, if I've read, when I flick through, like, my comrade here, um, having flicked through Capital without reading it at all, um, can you? I did notice something about vulgar economists, and I think in the um, Communist Manifesto, which I do read. Mm. Now, what did Marx mean about that, or does that have a significance amongst all the rest? Because when I'm watching television and they're dragging out the Fukuyamas and all the rest of it, telling us about end of um, history and all this stuff, I see them as vulgar economists. They're yeah. making big money. But I think my view is probably not what Marx expected well, it to be. Well, Marx was quite keen on being disparaging of other views. So am I. So, uh, <laughs> well, vulgar economists is kind of well, it would be what would be described as the mainstream economists of today, really. So, so I am right then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, no, Rob, you, you haven't spoken yet. Well, one of the main problems I've found uh, in, in doing um, trade union work for us, or the Shop Workers Union, um, is a lot of people um, turn around to me and say, um, I, we, we don't actually sort of, I guess they say, you know, we, we don't directly produce things anymore. You know, we're service sector workers. I, I, I wonder if you've got anything to sort of say on that, because obviously this is a wider kind of contention. Of, of bourgeois sort of economic theory, as far as I can, I can work out. I'm not a trained economist, but what they're saying is a lot of people now, you know, aren't direct yeah. producers. Therefore, you know, they're not members of the working class. Therefore, Marxism, socialism, whatever, doesn't really apply to them anymore. Um, I mean, so I, I mean, I don't know how you'd uh, well, approach some, that. With the service sector, I mean, the thing is, things like uh, transportations of goods and. It, selling them in shops and stuff. That's really part of the productive process anyway. So, but then I guess if you get to, well, there's a definition of productive and unproductive labor, whether they're, at, whether they're increasing the amount of value or whether it's just siphoning it from where it's already been produced. But it kind of be a mistake to think that, uh, that it's only kind of uh, factory work that creates new value. It's not, it is transportation and other things. Uh, then working class, it's a relation to the means of production, isn't it? It doesn't mean what your job is. So 
fact that you're having to, you know, you're not earning, I don't know, if you work in some insurance company, you're not earning your living from your ownership of money, you're still having to sell your labour power to, so that that's where they're going wrong there. So if, if you take class to me, how you learn a, earn a living, I mean, you'd have an infinite amount of classes, you could say chip shop owners are, form their own class or something. So it's just taking a, the meaning of class to be a relation to means of production, I think. Yeah. And by extension, distribution, almost. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Distribution is part of production, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you want to say Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, like, like Robbie, I, I'm a veteran of many years. Uh, I'm a trade union vet veteran. I can honestly claim it now. I feel quite proud. <coughs> uh, and uh, the, the issues that Rob raises, I've had, I've had to deal with as well. Um, and one of the things I found um, is I found using Ed Balls quite useful, actually, because when you're um, Ed Balls, I mean Ed Balls, I mean for all his faults, is actually quite a competent economist, albeit slightly vulgar. But he's a good. He knows his. He knows his stuff. He's not an idiot. I thought he was actually, but he's not. I've read some of his stuff. He did a very famous speech. I uh, can't remember. It's the Bloomberg speech, and he, he. And it was basically his critique of the idea of um, too much austerity at one time, uh, you know, tipping the economy to a double dip recession, and it was such a competently worked speech. Even Boris Johnson, when he was arguing with um, David Cameron about allocation of funds to London, sort of picked up, picked up on it and said. I think oh, balls is onto something, which was which is a major concession. That in that that I used that um, as an argument for, for 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 the people in in my shop, some of the shop steward there, and um, rather than giving them sort of you know sort of Marxist stuff, which you, straight off the you know SPGB type stuff or whatever you want to call it, um, I decided that that could come. You need a, a way in, and a way in would be to say if people got this idea in their heads that. This is inevitable. There has to be cuts because of budget, blah, 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 usual stuff. You say, well, actually, it's funny you should say that because not all the people in the ruling parties, the ruling class, are actually saying that. There's actually an argument that means there's a space, okay, and that, that and also links into the the ideological argument about how much of it is ideological and how much of it is necessary. I mean, traditionally, I would have argued it was absolutely necessary to restore the law of value, etc., that kind of thing. But I, I think. <laughs> Capitalism has got so much more going on in it, just other than just having a very sort of straight traditional uh, economic analysis of it. You could say that there is scope, there is different ways they could actually uh, uh, deal with the budget and is impose austerity. They could do it in a, in a slightly different way. So there is an argument there that would indicate there's an ideological element to it from the actual Conservative Party, and the Labour Party would do it in a slightly different way. So how that helps us in terms of the grand project of achieving socialism, I don't know. But in terms of a rhetorical device, when talking to people face to face, it just moves them away from this idea of inevitability mm -hmm. and opens up the space. If you can say, look, even the, even the ruling class don't actually agree that this is absolutely necessary, at least on a, on a rhetorical level they don't, uh, that opens up the space for other arguments, such as you know, the Socialist Party. So, um, yeah. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Sorry, Darren. I, I called you Mark earlier on when I spoke to you. <laughs> I, <laughs> I thought I thought you said Mark. <laughs> like, if you could say something about these hedge funds, equity groups, right? In a simple, I, I know that I, now they seem to they're very pathological. They seem to want, you know, to impose these austerities to the point, you know, they're squeezing the life, they're squeezing the life out of our societies, and how, how it's possible, you know, because it's brutish. What they're doing is brutish, you know, and the people at the at the at the, at the sharp end of it realise <coughs> these are, these are thugs in a, in an office. So, if you could say something about these the hedge funds and the role that they're playing in actually, uh, you know, in relationship to the debt. Uh, in various countries, or uh, I don't yeah. think it might be outside the scope of my oh, to say anything oh. meaningful on that. Really, right. but I mean, to do with the cuts, it's uh, probably useful to think of that more in terms of uh, restoring profit rates than uh, any of the other reasons you sort of hear in the media. Or, yeah. Um, I think that's 
about how um, Marx's his labor theory of values, economics, were sort of inspired, well, not just inspired, but actually was developed from the classical school. You can watch some people like Ricardo and... Uh, yeah, uh, briefly. I mean... He sort of well, he, obviously, no one kind of conjures up ideas out of magic in their own... Suddenly wakes up one day, do they? And with a, a, but, I mean, he, Marx's uh, value theory is... It's kind of built on the Ricardian ideas, but it's not this a critique of it really. He sort of sees the mistakes uh, of Ricardo to uh, the stumbling block of Ricardo was uh, well, Ricardo. Well, Ricardo didn't see the difference between prices. Uh, I might be getting this wrong, but between prices and values, thinking that things always sell at their uh, you know their value rate rather than which I didn't cover in this talk, in the, in the Marxian system, uh, things don't actually sell at the values, it's just through the struggle for competition, sort of values is distributed amongst capitalists. Uh, it's also in Marx that he differentiated between labour and labour power, which if you don't do that, you kind of end up in a bit of a contradiction when you're trying to say, well, how much what is the value of labour? Is so one hour's labour is worth one hour's labour. You kind of get in the in a circular kind of <coughs> argument. But he kind of realised that what was being sold wasn't the actual labour as such. It's kind of the just the capacity of the worker to you know, reproduce themselves. But uh, there is this in economic in uh, yeah, vulgar economics is actually most people that do call themselves Marxist economics these days. A kind of, well, Safarian might be great, which is kind of based on a Ricardian reinterpretation of Marx, which seems a bit strange being that it's spent a lot of his time criticising Ricardo. But uh, I could go on, but that's from. <coughs> How we as workers regard <coughs> regard capitalism and capitalists. How we see capitalism in other way it works, and, which is absolutely essential. I think it might be worthwhile actually sort of explaining it, explaining it to, to our fellow workers. How capitalism sees us. Well, you know, capitalism is, is a system where we are where we are employed. In, 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 as, as, as not as, as, as beings, but as, as a means to an end. We're not an end in ourselves, we're a means to, and that end is profit. So if we look at the word employ, it also means to use and to exploit. And so therefore capitalism doesn't see us as beings, as humans, it sees us as things. It cannot, it cannot, it cannot identify with us. Because, I mean, you cannot um, abuse, exploit, coerce, oppress those that you identify with. So therefore capitalism and capitalists are cynical in the sense that, you know, we, 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 have, no, we have no real human being. We are just there to be exploited. And, and I think that's easily explained to our fellow workers because, you know, the, 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 the proof, the facts are all around to prove it irrefutably. Um, Laid on from Daniel's point, uh, yeah, I mean, on one level, it is very easy to point this out to me, but it, and I think at certain times, people will nod their heads, particularly now maybe, in, because people are feeling the pinch, and say, yeah, yeah, that's true. But it doesn't seem to, that in itself, that understanding that intellectually doesn't seem to necessarily transcend anything. Because if you, because this comes back down to the theories of human nature, people have got this, particularly when they're being oppressed, or so we're always being oppressed, but particularly when the the uh, thumb screws have been put on. Workers, I, I think, this is the point that Zizek makes, you know, before people start to become revolutionary, you, you first of all, you go through a sort of almost like a reactionary psychological process whereby you sort of attune yourself to the new reality and you start to say, well, <coughs> the problem is human beings. This is, this is it. I mean, yeah, sure, I agree with you, Danny. Absolutely right. We were exploited. But 
that's the nature of the beast, that's the nature of humanity. So we have to get past that hurdle, that sort of almost emotional hurdle, and it is an emotional rather than an intellectual one, or maybe it's a bit of both, uh, in order to... So of course you can explain a concept, and people might agree with you. I remember having a conversation with someone at work once, they say, they, well, I stand at the photocopy and they say, oh, I wish, you could, we, I wish we could work a four day week. And of course, I, being naive as I was at the time, I thought, oh my God, I'll, I'll get her in a party before, when I was in the party at the time. I'll get her in a, par I'll get her in a party before lunchtime. And of course, when I explained to her why she couldn't have a four day week, she couldn't get away quick enough. <laughs> uh, and, that, and that's the problem, because sometimes people don't actually want answers to the questions they, they raise. Because there's, because the human mind isn't just rational. There's other elements going on, the irrationality with the whole history of psychoanalysis for the last 100 years. And that's the problem, I think. You know, just a purely rational approach doesn't necessarily get anywhere because you have to understand, I think we must know this by now, surely, human, the human, human beings are not entirely rational. We're rational in one respect, but we're deeply irrational in others. So we have to have, find some kind of mechanism which marries those two together. Uh, Rob, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, um, I, I think um, a, a, a vital contribution the SPGB makes and, and has made uh, throughout its existence um, to, towards uh, economic theory is we, we don't really uh, believe that capitalism will automatically collapse in and of itself. Um, now, obviously, not, not just because of what's going on in the moment, but, but this is a kind of wider... Uh, this is a debate within the, the wider kind of current of the left. Um, you know, for example, the Socialist Workers' Party more or less goes along with um, the, the American economist and historian Robert Brenner, who essentially argues, you know, that uh, more or less these are the end times. This is, you know, that this could well be the final crisis of capitalism. Now, of course, you know, ver various people uh, from Lenin and even before onwards, have been arguing that this is the final crisis and capitalism's about to collapse. Now, the SPGB has, has, has never said that. Um, um, so, uh, and, and on the other side of this debate, there's also kind of more interesting, to my mind, left-wing uh, economists and writers such as Bill Jeffries, who are saying, well, no, you know, capitalism isn't about to collapse. Actually, if anything, it's probably, it, just in, in terms of um, profitability and the rest of it, it it's... Uh, kind of stronger than it's ever been. So, so you know, you, you have this sort of uh, t two poles within the left. Like, like I say, um, you, we, we in the SPGB have, have always maintained that um, capitalism will never uh, collapse, you know, because of its own, uh, you know, on, on, on its own. Uh, I, I wonder if, you know, you've got anything to, uh, to sort of say about that and how we could kind of communicate that. Uh, crises are just part of the normal functioning of the capitalist system, so... Uh... But I mean, yeah. So, so uh, I mean, so, so for example, you know, the last the last book that Chris Harmon did, and uh, he was, was the editor of Socialist Worker, and, and was a great sort of you know commentator on these things. I think he's passed away. I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah, I think yeah. he's died. I saw isn't him he? two weeks before he died. Oh right. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> was he looking peaky? Must be something else. Um, yeah, must have. Yeah. Uh, what did you do? Um, uh, no, but, but, but his, his last book was called Zombie Capitalism. Yeah. You know, so, so it was this idea that capitalism's outlived its usefulness. You know, that, that, that it's uh, basically just kind of uh, sort of carrying on, but it, it's not actually kind of uh, uh, developing the modes of production any further. If, if you want to use it in a sort of old-fashioned kind of language, I, I don't know how you kind of respond to that. Uh. theory. Yeah, that's that's what they call it, don't they? But. Well, I mean, for I'm not sure really what to how to comment on back on that. So. Well, or, or, or do do, do crises get ever worse? Or why, why is there this idea that crisis always there must be this last smooth process of crisis, growth, crisis, growth, crisis, growth? I mean, surely, I mean, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm not just uh, you know a Marxian approach must surely at least have the possibility of it not being a linear smooth process. It has to go through, you know, you know certain qualitative mm. ups and certain yeah. qualitative downs, and I think that's one thing I've always, personally, I've always found missing from, from the SPGB a little bit. This idea you have this sort of very smooth uh, crisis theory where it <coughs> always works itself back up because until you get political consciousness, you can't have a revolution. But to me, those are two separate questions. You, they're, they're, well, they're not two separate questions, but they relate to each other, but not in a you can't have your economics based upon your political theory, that's what I'm saying. 
just because you be one believes that you get revolution in a particular way, that can't determine how you view uh, crisis. That yeah, makes absolutely. sense. Yeah, I mean, which would be which would be possibly a criticism. Well, a, a theory is not true or false because of its implications. No, is it? no, so, uh, no. Um, but I don't think there's anything to just suggest that I don't know productivity sort of you know crisis goes up and down and it's a on a smooth baseline yeah. and it's, maybe there's another sort of cycle and it's all good. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, well, I mean, this crisis, like, you know, one of, one of the reasons I don't know where a crisis it, it is a possibility for, you know, to have a big crisis and a small crisis and then a, perhaps a smaller one and then a bigger one. You know, I mean, it's a possibility, but, you know, you've got to look at the fact that, I mean, globalisation, the world is getting more and more interdependent, interrelated and interconnected. So that might be one of the reasons why the crisis, I mean, this one, you know, looks like a big one to me. And to get back to, to follow on from my point that you answered, I think what happens, and you know, I've had a pretty good, I've had quite a fair amount of experience of sort of like laying out the case for socialism uh, in front of thousands of people and just seeing them like sort of glaze over and just walk away. And I think one of the reasons for that is that when you actually tell people about socialism, the, the, the social relationship that they're in, you're letting them know that they're being taken for chumps. Mm, they don't like they're it. being taken for chumps and they don't like that. They don't like hearing that. And the other thing <coughs> is that, you know, we're all conditioned by our situation, like all things. And if we look at, if we look at our situation, we're grown up as members of the working class. And we're told something about us that is totally, totally untrue. Because whenever a politician, a corporate, an academic, people with power, people with influence, Whenever they refer to us like the working class, you do everything, everything, to reproduce this fantastic society of ours, this complicated, unbelievably technological society of ours day to day. They seem to always refer to us as ordinary people. Now, if you're conditioned to think of yourself as an ordinary person, who you believe yourself to be determines what you want, and all ordinary people want is an ordinary life. And there are these people who've got all the money, the implements, the power, they must therefore be extraordinary. So therefore, what we do, we allow these people to interpret our lives for us, to tell us what to wear, what to eat, how to think, who to be. Now, so also to be, to be working class, to be a servant, we have to be humbled. And that's all part of like being convinced that we're ordinary. And the point for the capitalist classes is that humble people don't make revolution, they do as they're told. Now, what that means to me is that we, the working class, lack esteem. We have ego. We're given, we, you know, we're, we're, we're allowed to have lots of ego, which is like the substitute for esteem. We've never really had a good look at what we are. I mean, the, the, the word esteem comes from the verb to estimate. We've never made an estimate of who we are. We sell ourselves for a wage, salary, or a fee, a price. You know, and uh, as we know, like this is the labour power is a commodity, and a commodity, as we as we've heard earlier, is priced on the amount of necessary labour time gone into its production. Well, if we look at us, you know, I know for a fact that my parents went out into society, worked long and hard to make sure I had a life, food, clothing, shelter, medicine, education. They went out and did their part. So without that, I mean, th without that work embodied in me, I wouldn't be here. You know, as like our work is embodied in commodities, my parents' work and society is embodied in me. And without my, without my grandparents, my parents wouldn't be around, so therefore I wouldn't be around, so their work is embodied in me. So you can go back as far as you like, even beyond the time we became modern humans, and every living thing that's led up to us, living, breathing, thinking, considering here today, has had to work, struggle, overcome, discover, educate, love, nurture, all requiring effort, all requiring work, and we are the living embodiment of all that work, or we sell ourselves for a price. When if we add all that work up, embodied in us, we are priceless. There's the contradiction, and that's what I think we have to do as a party, is to, is to give our class some self-esteem, to make it think well of itself, to, 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 to get it to be disgusted with its servant, uh, with its servant status.
short while ago, um, somebody uh, in this meeting referred to uh, the critique of the uh, socialist case that we hear so many times about uh, the so-called uh, selfishness of uh, human nature in double inverted commas. And um, uh, very often uh, this critique I is based on uh, the fact that we believe that in a socialist society, people will work uh, voluntarily, give voluntary uh, uh, contributions towards the production of uh, goods and services. And uh, of course, there's the other side of the uh, coin taking from the free store. But it's the voluntary aspect of it uh, that I just wanted to concentrate on uh, here uh, briefly, because we've heard so many people saying that this attitude uh, is unrealistic that we think that people will, on a mass scale, work uh, in a voluntary uh, way. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, how things have turned out, particularly uh, now and I I I in the, the recent past. Of course, voluntary work has been around for, uh, uh, for decades, for uh, hundreds of years. But um, we're noticing that uh, in this uh, latest crisis of capitalism, uh, more and more enterprises are uh, forcing uh, or encouraging, a mixture of both, uh, workers to work on uh, a voluntary basis uh, and to do more and more of their work uh, unpaid. Now, I remember back in the 1980s, reading in some book, I can't remember the title now, but the statistic was at that time, related to the uh, UK, that there were about 20% uh, of the population, I'm not sure whether they were including uh, adult uh, children as well, but 20% of the population in the UK was involved in some type of uh, voluntary work. Uh, so, as I say, that's back in the 80s. Now we read about it uh, all the time. The libraries, for example, because they're uh, short of cash, are taking on, uh, they're, they're shedding uh, quite a lot of their uh, temporary paid staff and full time paid staff, and they're taking on uh, voluntary uh, workers. So there was uh, some TV report about some uh, ladies, in inverted commas, in, in the prosperous county of uh, Buckinghamshire. Their village library had closed down. Bush Buckinghamshire County Council could no longer support, keep it, uh, uh, could no longer afford to keep it open. So all these f relatively well people, uh, uh, well off people, were going into their library and uh, running itself. Uh, run itself. That's just a small uh, example, but we hear about it all the more uh, now, and even from our so-called practical uh, uh, politicians, the coalition, they're talking about. Uh, people getting involved uh, more and more in the, in the big society, this type of capitalist propaganda crap that we hear so much about, it, 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 it's based to a significant extent on people making contributions to, uh, to running uh, uh, parts of society which are producing goods and services. So really, uh, that the people who thought uh, that we were being so uh, impractical uh, by talking about how, uh, 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 how uh, by advocating uh, voluntary work, uh, that the, the, their critique of us has proved to be uh, completely wrong. Of course, in the past, in history, when, uh, the, when uh, people were go going out in the Victorian ages with soup ki kitchens and the, the voluntary work was going on then. But it's going on now. We're more aware of it. Even the mainstream politi uh, politicians accepting it. And just one other thing that I'd like to, to add to this, 
The big difference, of course, as we're, I think everybody is well aware of, uh, as far as voluntary labour is concerned, of course, if you, under capitalism, if you work voluntarily, you don't get any money, uh, usually, for your voluntary work by the nature of it. You could try and get something for free in the shops, <laughs> and of course, uh, the police are on your backs uh, like anything. So, uh, really, uh, for, uh, uh, as far as uh, practicality is concerned, volunt voluntarism on a widespread full-time scale is a complete non-starter and is unrealistic under capitalism. Under socialism, it's the most practical thing uh, that there could possibly be because, uh, uh, okay, people give their labour. Do they need to buy things in the shops under socialism? Of course they don't. They go along to the uh, distribution store and they, uh, they pick up uh, what they need uh, for free. So uh, mo most practical there. So we, the, the reality, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, the events of recent years has turned out, uh, has made our, uh, our critics uh, look false. Good point. So perhaps the saviour of, of capitalism now is to introduce the system of voluntary giving in shops like Sainsbury's and Tesco's and say to balance the voluntary <laughs> workers who are out there. Well, you never know, Ooh. somebody might come up with that. Um, so, Bob, uh, Bob right, you want to say first and then, then you. Yeah. I, I just maybe to follow on from that slightly, but um, all right, there is a recognisable kind of phenomenon, I guess, within a, a modern capitalist economy, and that's unpaid work. Now, mm. you, you've, you've touched upon one side of it, which is uh, obviously, you know, voluntary uh, type things. The other one, and this is a huge, huge thing, is unpaid work by people in workplaces. Mm, yeah. All right, now th th this again, this comes back to my trade union work. All right, you know, I, I when I was uh, in management in retail, for example, was contracted to work 40 hours. I regularly around Christmas was working 60 hours a week. You know, I, I did one stint over eight days where I did 78 hours, uh, and then got in trouble for refusing to come in on my day off. But anyway, I'm not bitter. Yes, I am. Um, <laughs> um, but, but no, but seriously, but 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 um, on, on, on a more useful basis, um, I uh, one of the great pieces of sport I used to do in Obbins was take uh, the head of human resources, i.e. the personnel guy, out because uh, I used to be in contact with him all the time, obviously over employment issues, um, and get him drunk. And he'd say all sorts of injudicious things to me. Um, and, uh, and at one point, I, but, 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 but on, on a more serious, uh, seriously, one, one of the things that I heard that this guy told me once was um, by his calculations and by the calculations of the board of Obbins, unpaid work, all right, unpaid work got that company through the first six w weeks of the year, i.e., you know, they were, the money they were making on the first six, six weeks of the year, their turnover basically was, was, was the, 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 the end of uh, what they got free from the workforce, essentially, you know, of, of the entire company. And this, you know, it was a fairly big company, Obbins, about 400 shops at its biggest uh, point. Now, that's a phenomenal amount that they're getting. This is a current, you know, and, and, and this is sort of system-wide. You know, I mean, I, we all know about overwork, you know. All right, I won't go into any more anecdotal, you know, examples, because I'm sure we all have them. So it's, but, but I'd say this is part and parcel of the same thing with voluntary work. You know, it, it's about, as we've been saying, increasing the rates of profit, increasing the rates of exploitation, getting more out of us, squeezing more out of us. I've had this argument, and I'll shut up in a bit, uh, with, with local community organisers in Collier's Wood who are trying to get people to voluntarily run, including myself, run the library in Collier's Wood. And I'm not going to say what my exact response to them was, because you know, we want to keep it fairly, fairly sort of clean. But what I was saying is you, you, you are rep you're replacing paid work but by innocent members here, you know, but, but by, by people who might actually you know, need to do the extra 20 hours to, to make their wages up. All right, if you're doing voluntary work for them, you are abolishing paid work for a lot of people and you know you're going to be pushing more and more people to the margins um like i say i, I think this is part of a, a wider sort of problem the unpaid work you know we're already proving that we can live in a post-capitalist society unfortunately we still fucking need sorry we, we need money you know to reproduce ourselves and live and our living standards are getting squeezed because of it it's another you know urgent indicator of why we need to move beyond a capitalist society yeah, I'm, 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 from what Rob was saying, of course, it's double unpaid work, isn't it? Because you're, you're being unpaid for half your work anyway, and then there's the unpaid work on top of that. Uh, and yeah, this big stuff Vincent was talking about, big society anarchism. 
as I call it. Um, it's interesting, when uh, <coughs> David Cameron became Prime Minister, I was at the Anarchist Book Fair that year, and a lot of anarchists were kind of like a bit confused. Not in the, I'm not having a go at the anarchists, by the way. <laughs> about, well, hold on a minute. The rhetoric, the, is there a critique coming from the right which marries up with um, left-wing anarchism? I think this is what Adam, we'll probably get some of this to, this afternoon, about how uh, there is a, a nominal crossover uh, in terms of, you know, which political party likes charity the best? The Labour Party or the Tories? The Tories. Why? Because the Labour Party are statists. They believe you solve problems with social democracy. Therefore, charities can be pushed to the margins. The Conservatives, historically, argue the opposite. They don't like social programming from the top. They like the, have this idea in their philosophy of organic, you know, uh, reproduction at the basic level, which, again, corresponds with big society anarchism. The idea that you don't need the public sector, you don't need people that will be on proper contracts and all this. You need, you know, people can do it themselves. They don't need leaders. They don't need someone telling them what to do. They don't need plutocrats, you know, directing things. Uh, they, they can do these things, run libraries themselves, which of course is a very seductive idea, isn't it? And it does, again, I've used this word rhetoric a lot today. I do apologize. Rhetorically, again, a lot of, a lot of politics is rhetoric does link in to the kind of arguments that the SPGB will use, or certain anarchists will use. So you have to be aware of that ideologically, that it's a very similar logic. There's a similar uh, a, a discourse being used here. Why? Because of the reasons Rob's been highlighting. It undermines the labour market. It undermines people, well, it undermines, doesn't under, like, well, it does actually undermine the labour market, but principally it undermines people in the, or people's power inside the labour market. And, and so the paradox being, of course, it does point beyond the labour market, which is absolutely crucial to capitalism. If without it, you can't have capitalism. So, it, it, well, I'm trying, so there's a certain paradoxes here. So in terms of, uh, I mean, I've spoken to a, a Tory, I was talking to a Tory, I was talking to a, an American neocon the other day, and it was quite interesting how on a very basic level, on a discourse level, we could share a lot in common. He had a background in Trotskyism, that all the neocons do. <laughs> You were in the yeah. Monday Club. I was in the Monday Club. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the idea of um, you know, the struggle for a better society, liberalism in his case, communism in mine, there was the, you, that's just one side of conservative thought. Then you've got this Cameron Red Tory type stuff which is coming through about the idea that people can spontaneously reproduce society. <coughs> well, you know, what can we do about that, comrades? I mean, that's quite interesting, isn't it? They've actually admitted it now. You don't need people telling you what to do. You can do it yourself. And that's coming from the Conservative Party. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's fraught with contradictions, of course. Of course, I mean, absolutely. When you start yeah. to look into it, uh, Cameron is saying we'll actually provide financial support for, 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 for people to do what is needed in society. Mm. But of course, we will actually control uh, how we give the financial absolutely. support on, on the basis of our own agenda. Yes, so, absolutely. So, you know, we, give, we give power to the people yeah. as long as the people are doing what we suggest that they are Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, Janet? Uh, Jack yes, back to the volunteering. I was glad to hear the distinction between um, wh where you're working for uh, no money in capitalism, everyone else is getting it, but you're not, unpaid, uh, vo unpaid work, and volunteering. Now, one thing I've noticed, particularly since the unemployment, the old unemployment centres went, and brought in the, uh, the, the labour exchanges when they went and the job centres came in. Volunteers, coerced, struggling, dragged into charity shops all over Britain under this system of um, uh, work trials or, or workfare. This has been going on for at least 15, 20 years that I know about, where, you know, if you want benefits, you have to, every so often, depending how long you are out of work or out of paid employment, have to go onto these schemes that might last for a month or, or six weeks. But someone said it over there where work uh, companies stay open because people go in and work voluntary. The job centres have been sending a reserve army all over the country, and this has been going on for, I know of, 20 years, you know, even now. They have the children on one, they call it training and apprenticeship, and, you know, some apprenticeship is worth it, you know, th uh, things that are socially necessary, 
plumbing, you know, stuff like that. But to get to the point that I want to make as well, capitalism, in my view, would, ne would never have gone on as long as it's gone on in this last, uh, say, the last 30 years, if it weren't for what is called the third force which the government alludes to all the time. I see it in lots of lefty magazines and all this sort of stuff. All those, the millions of carers that are about. Now, I know of another set of um, carers who nobody talks about unless it's a charity, which I don't have anything, you know, I really wish we could get rid of them quickly, charities. But the children who are looking after the, the drug adult parents, the children who are looking after um, dementia parents, uh, the, the carers, the, you know, who shouldn't be having to put up with this sort of stuff. We live in a system which has totally outgrown any usefulness or, or, or does anything to us. It maims us every day. I watched the news yesterday. Four miners went in, in Wales. It hurt me because I was reading uh, uh, the history of the working class in England and all this sort of stuff, where I saw a section where it said 4,000 were wiped out in the 1880s at one go. One village went, 4,000 miners. And from I read that, capitalism, they're dying at the Olympic Stadium, men and women are falling off a scaffolding. All these buildings where you see the Donald Trumps stand in front and say, I built that. No, you didn't. Somebody else did and somebody else cleaned the windows. Capitalism mains workers. It's not just about the money. It ruins our relationships. It makes us cruel to our children. It makes us cruel to our parents, our brothers, our sisters, not all of us. If you can afford to pay the bills, you're not going to have an argument over money in your house. Domestic violence would not happen to an extent. It would still go on because of patriarchy and all the rest of the bullshit, but it wouldn't happen in the extent that it goes on to in, in the way we see. Capitalism is maiming us. I saw a 10-year-old baby with my colleague the other day in a hospital, just being born, 10 days old and thought, what sort of life are you going to give this beautiful child? We have to get this message across to the rest of them and get them to take a bit of responsibility. Okay. Anyone else want, would like to make a, a comment or ask a question? Yeah, just going back to volunteering. I mean, I've pointed you in the direction on Facebook of a really good um, lecture given by a guy that was illustrated, RSA, on, uh, on the on, on the you know the our, our incentive works and uh, it's it's well worth looking up it's it's on it's on YouTube tube if you go to type in RSA you'll find it and uh, and essentially well, you know what 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 the guy's saying and what's being illustrated is that money you know the more money you throw at something to incentivise people you, the results do not correlate and uh, and, and it spoke of uh, one company did dealing with software. And once a month, it just you know brings people in for, for a day and says, like, get together and just get on with anything you want to do. You know, that's sort of like creative and it's, uh, it's uh, something to do with, with the business. And they just get in and they, and they work. And that's where their best ideas come from. People just working on their own initiative with you know, no extra money incentive, just doing something that they think is worthwhile or, 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 or they enjoy. So, uh, and, and the other thing about, you know, about society, if people want to be free, what they really got to, re what they got, got, got to appreciate is that, you know, you can only be free when you give freely of your socially creative abilities. And therefore you go on to take freely of what's in the common store. Because freedom essentially, I mean, the, 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 the foundation of freedom is a life without price. So, you know, I mean, that should be an incentive uh, you know, when you appreciate that, to to, to 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 sort of like go into a socialist society and be prepared to to give you know to give to volunteer, and as as William Morris said, I just had his one William Morris once said that one volunteer is worth ten pressed men. Um, this is quite interesting because I, I think in human resources um, it's now a, a commonplace idea that if you can actually get a worker on board. You know, getting you know on message, uh, you can actually do do without one in three of the people that you actually employ. It's actually worth a third of a person to get somebody on board, 
um, with uh, you know sort of getting enthusiastic about, about, about their work. But I think also um, we had an interesting exercise uh, not so long ago at our own place of work, uh, where we actually asked people what motivated them, or, or the management asked people what motivated them, and actually. Uh, monetary remuneration came actually very low down on the list. I don't know whether it would have done if their jobs were under threat at the time, you know, so I mean, you, you might have to take that into consideration, but I, th I think it's very easy for um, employers to, um, uh, to capitalise on that, uh, to, uh, to, to make use of that and, and uh, encourage that kind of free labour that, that people very often give. I mean, <coughs> your, six, your six weeks of the year, I got a quick calculation that's one day in every two weeks that everyone is actually giving for free and I know I have seen some calculations which suggest that, that um, many firms would actually be in severe crisis if they did not actually receive that kind of free labor on a regular basis yeah and I mean I was I, I, I was in the job working at the school and we did we did loads of work that was outside our contracts mm -hmm. you, know, you know it's not just the amount of time you put in it's the it's the kind of work you do Anyone? Uh, hang on. Um, Brian, do you have to respond to this sort of linking up, um, you know, David Cameron with anarchism, you know, as if conservatives and anarchism sort of go together like uh, horse and guard kind of thing. Look, you have to face the fact that with. There's an interesting contrast, actually, between Margaret Thatcher and the present Prime Minister, actually, because Margaret Thatcher was basically saying the only thing that exists, actually, are individuals, the government. And capitalism. Okay. Now, is the switch over because what is brought in is this conservative tradition of sort of voluntary thing. But of course, what they, what the capitalists are, are into is not, act, and what Cameron's into is not actually giving power and responsibility to local people to run their own lives. Like this, this organisation is a form of voluntary association to organise people organising themselves, which is what anarchism is all about. People organising their own. It's not that. It's a kind of smokescreen, really. All this idea about big society helping things, you know, um, power to local community is just a smokescreen. It's ideological. It's ideological. Because what's really going on is all what is now public services, particularly with relation to health, social social services, um, education and what is given the opportunity for capitalists then to move in and to privatise what up to now has been actually, particularly th things like the health service of things. And it's interesting that most anarchists actually are very keen on, on the National Health Service. You know, so, it, so it's, it's a kind of smokescreen, this uh, Cameron, it's a big, big smokescreen. It's given opportunities for capitalism to move in when things are freed up and they, they are moving in. You know, they're just... So, wasn't it your magazine or one magazine was saying that um, that with the health service now that these private health companies are like vultures? Yeah. They're like was it was it in your magazine? I, I read it somewhere that basically what's happening is is all these big private health uh, corporations are like vultures, yeah. like vultures around you know what's happening. So that's uh... yeah. Leads on to this point. I mean, uh... The, 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 the standard viewpoint amongst, amongst the capitalist class is that the, the public sector is a drain on the private sector. We are saying it's the opposite, and I agree with you. It's actually the other way around. That the, uh, the, the private sector, the public sector, is a milking cow for the private sector. No question, particularly now. Um, I agree with everything you just said about the David Cameron. And what I'm talking about at, at discourse level, it's very, uh, it's very important that if um, the ruling class start adopting or aping certain language features we will use ourselves and that's obviously interesting from a propaganda point of view and it says a lot about uh, where things actually are. Of course it's a smokescreen, I completely agree. And it is interesting that um, the contradiction of course in what Margaret Thatcher was talking about, there's no such thing as a society, uh, that is an untenable position, always was an untenable position and the modern Conservative Party has to reflect that in some way and so therefore you have this rather silly attempt to uh, Bring in sort of old, old one, old one nation Toryism with the market, which <coughs> complements what the Labour Party did when they sort of moved towards the market away from uh, social democracy. You know, and, uh, so you've got this kind of these are all these ideas coming together. So you've got like a kind of like a a social market, but v social with a small s, very small s. Because the only way you can have a market, and this is the point that even Adam Smith makes in the theory of moral sentiments, you, you, know, you, have, that, that you have to have a, a society. You can't not have a society to have a market. There has to be a prerequisite. There has to be a certain level of socialization 
for even a barbaric system like capitalism to take place. There has to be a certain level of civilization, and this is true. Uh, one other thing I'd like to say, yeah, it's interesting. Um, work ethic, that's the new thing that's in now again, isn't it? It's ironical. Isn't it ironical that at a time when the working class are being squeezed as much as they are, that <laughs> the ideology of work and unpaid work and uh, even with unemployment going up of people still blaming the unemployed and saying, well, people are not contributing, they're not doing their bit. Even though the unemployment figures have gone up in the last four years like that, shape of a curve, in relation to the economic crisis. I mean, uh, the, one of the reasons problems we've got, of course, is if you're dealing with a population who can't even understand that when you have an economic crisis at the level of severity we've had in the last three or four years, and, un and unemployment has corresponded to that, people still can't make an automatic link between those two factors. Now, that is a serious intellectual problem. Never mind the emotional side I was talking about earlier. We have to get around that. This is very, very basic mathematics. We're talking super ba basic mathematics, which I would have thought a 15-year-old could understand. But um, again, there must be reasons why people can't make that deduction, because obviously they can really. So why don't they? What stops them? What stops people, make, what stops people going, unemployment goes up because there's an economic crisis, wasn't caused by us, therefore we're not to blame, but we're going to blame the unemployed or blame people for not, for not trying hard enough. We're all in this together, all this kind of crappy rhetoric we're hearing. So there are contradictions and, uh, you know, how people rationally, again, come back to that point, work stuff out, I mean, or how they don't rationally work, work stuff out is, is of interest. And again, there's a, it seems to me there's an emotional blockage in the system here. We're still trading way, way, way behind as a class in terms of understanding. But maybe that's part or parcel of the process. We have to go through this slightly silly reactionary period before we start to weigh things up. I, uh, one of the, the, the most extraordinary rationalizations I ever came across is that I was discussing this with somebody, oh, this was quite, quite a few years ago, and uh, he was of the opinion that, uh, that in fact that uh, capitalist crisis was a result of large numbers of the working class suddenly deciding that they really didn't want to work and actually becoming unemployed. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, I think I, I, I read somewhere, you know, I mean, I can't reproduce it word for word, so it's just an idea of the, of the, of the meaning of what was said, is that society is always, is always like lagging behind, it's like possibilities. Yeah. And then every now and again he plays catch up. And it doesn't completely catch up, but it makes a leap and he gets nearer to its time. So, you know, hopefully, you know, that's going to happen sooner rather than later, if that's the case. Yeah, but I think it's quite clear uh, and uh, that uh, capitalism, uh, the very idea, uh, idea of it, is synonymous with uh, barbarity. Yes. Uh, certainly, uh, humanity is on the receiving end of the atrocities of this monstrosity of capitalism that exists. And uh, that is backed up by the fact we've been talking uh, recently about voluntary work, whether it's a voluntary work in isolation or unpaid work, uh, certainly in the workplace where workers are working for nothing. They're not, re we're being asked by our monstrous mainstream political leaders to uh, make contributions unpaid in the very system which uh, dictates that uh, everything, or practically everything, has a monetary price. Doesn't no matter how valuable and vital it is to us human beings to survive, uh, whether it's the roof over our heads, uh, whether it's the education that we need, whether it's the health service, it's all got a monetary price which people are being forced to pay under this capitalist monstrosity. Uh, whereas on the other hand, they're being saying, oh, well, you, you, we're, they're being told by these capitalist politicians, you should go out and work more for nothing. So it, it, it's just uh, r ridiculous and we need a, a, a proper uh, human rep uh, substitution for, for capitalism.
Yeah, I think uh, one one of the um, one of the features of, of human beings which uh, actually makes socialism a possibility is also works against us very much within the, the context of our, our current society, and that is that uh, that people do want to be cooperative, and therefore in the workplace um, you go to work for a wage or being exploited work. But you simply could not do that work if you didn't actually believe, in some level of your being, believe in it. And you, you had some commitment to it. And I know people, I mean, like myself, I mean, I have, I have to undergo some kind of double think at work all the time. You know? It's like if, if I simply kind of kept in mind that I was just simply here to be exploited, I'd be sitting there grumbling away to myself and my days would be absolutely appalling. So I have to actually engage in this double think and actually, and, and sometimes I put in extra, extra hours because actually sometimes I'm doing a little bit of work that occasionally looks as if it might be useful to somebody and I've got engaged with it, you know. So I think it's that, that quality of human beings that, that you know, that they, they must look for something of value in their work, which enables, um, enables the capitalist class to exploit that. Um, we're coming up to about ten two now. Now lunch is at um, is going to be at one. Are we actually providing lunch here? Yes. Yes. yes, we're providing lunch for everyone if, upstairs um, in the kitchen. If anybody providing would like to stay. Volunteer work. Sorry. Providing you do some volunteer work. We're providing work. you with some some, some voluntary work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> can, come and have lunch on us if if you're visitors and, and members indeed, um, uh, which will be available. So um, we'll be breaking at one o'clock and. Uh, uh, we'll have a now for lunch.